setting up your meeting for Facebook Live. Oh, look, there I am on the thing. Mm -hmm. Let's see if I can find mm -hmm. it. Okay, we're live. So good evening, everyone. And on behalf of Dean Messenger and the University of Tennessee College of Social Work, welcome to everyone who took time out to join us today. Uh, to our students, our faculty, our UT, UTK alum, and also to anyone at University of Tennessee uh, in our community, thank you so very much. My name is Camille Hall. And I'm a faculty in the College of Social Work and I have the pleasure and the honor of presenting our first Facebook Live uh, Generating Justice Speaker Series with Ms. Caroline Randall Williams. Caroline is a poet and writer in resident at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. She is a graduate of Harvard University. She holds an MFA from the University of Mississippi and is taught in Mississippi and West Virginia. In 2015, her book of poetry, Lucy Negro Redux, was published by Amber Sad Books. Lucy Negro Redux was adapted as a ballet by the Nashville Ballet. And this past June, she published an opinion piece in the New York Times titled, You Want a Confederate Monument? My Body is, Con is a Confederate Monument. Please welcome Caroline Randall Williams to the University of Tennessee College of Social Work Generating Justice interview series. We are so pleased to welcome you to be with us this evening. Thank you so much for having me, Camille. I'm delighted to be with all of y'all in cyberspace this evening. So in your masterful work, you want a Confederate monument. My body is a Confederate monument. You write, I have rape colored skin. My light brown blackness is a living testament to the rules, the practices, the causes of the old South. If there are those who want to remember the legacy of the Confederacy, if they want monuments, well then my body is a monument. My skin is a monument. Your first two sentences are jarring, reviling, hushed, historical truth about white sexual violence inflicted against black women. How has your skin color affected your life? Oh my gosh. <laughs> you just uh, came out with the big questions first. How has my skin color affected my life? I think that that question sort of, you know, if I'm being very honest, it has uh, two parts, really. You know, when you think about the condition of being Black in America and, you know, so saying my, my skin, like my brown skin affects my life because I am not a white person. And so that part of the lived experience of Blackness is one thing to address. And another thing to address is like, you know, light skin, you know, the colorism and the spectrum of colors that we live in in Black bodies in this country, that has its own separate impact, even like within our community and outside, you know, outside of the uh, Black community. Um, and I think those are two different things. Because, you know, I think um, in the world, there's ways in which having light skin can create uh, certain kinds of tension within the Black community, but it also provides me certain kinds of, it, I mean, I think this is a subjective truth or a subjective opinion, but I think it's provided me in some ways with certain kinds of access to certain kinds of white spaces that have, um, you know, made me feel like, in, especially in this moment, um, grateful for it in the sense that it allows me, I've infiltrated far in order to be able to give back. <laughs> You know, it's, 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 it's created space for me that I only want to use to advance Black people. You know, I think there was, there, there's this misconception or there has been in the past that light skin can um, be a division that makes you think you're better than or that you have, um, that you're reaching toward a certain kind of whiteness. But for me, 
my like to the degree that my light skin means anything to me it means it makes me a more useful tool to undermine the oppressor <laughs> right and i think and and part of that to me and it's part of why i wrote the article is that my skin color is proof that they're lying when they say that these were good guys right my skin is proof i am a walking evidence and i'm also walking evidence of the fortitude of the women in my family um, and so, and that to me, you know, that's been a big part of, you know, how the, my skin color has impacted my life. Also, you know, the more that you lean into creating art in this country, especially in this moment, you realize, you know, from music to words, to food, to, you know, the way of being in the world, the black American experience is just so rich and dynamic and what I would choose if I had a choice. Um, and I was by some miracle born into it. And like, you know, being brown in this moment, I'm just so grateful. <laughs> I'm just so grateful for the richness of it. I, I, I have to say, I think. Does that answer the question? Yes, yes. thank you so much <laughs> for your forthrightness. So if I may uh, ask a follow-up question on this subject, how do you reconcile your historical painful past with your present circumstances? Whoa, <laughs> I love this. How do I reconcile my historical painful past and my present circumstances? I mean, I think that the first instinct is to say, well, I mean, uh, we're products of our past, right? So I think it's, um, and I've had this crazy luxury of always, you know, my family has one, been privileged enough to have a sort a record, sometimes a physical record, but very much a robust oral record of our past for several generations. Um, and we've always talked about it and I and never with a source of shame, certainly no shame about what happened to any of the black people in our family. Maybe a little bit of shame that we're related to like terrible white people, but um that's a that's different that's a different thing. Um and so I feel like I was very much raised with the stories of the past swirling around and informing my present. So I don't know that it's ever that a reconciliation's ever been required because I was raised by the mem the, the memories of the past were part of like what fed me mm -hmm. as I was becoming myself, right? Um and I and I guess so not so much reconciliation, but um growing into my sense of obligation to be a faithful custodian of the work of the people that came before me. And for example, you know, I have this hard story, you know, of my great great grandmothers and what they lived through and, you know, the things that were done to their bodies. But then, you know, a couple of generations out from that, native Knoxvillian, my grandfather, Avon Williams Jr., who was Thurgood Marshall's first cousin and a big civil rights attorney here in Nashville the first black man to be elected to the Tennessee State Senate since Reconstruction when he was elected to his position, to his seat. Um, you know, knowing that I was his granddaughter, um, growing into that and feeling like, you know, with, you know, among the many indignities uh, that black people in this country have endured, you know, one of them is whatever competence you have, whatever excellence you exhibit, you know, things like being able to um, have capital that you can pass on to your family. They didn't let us do that even when we were, we had every right to it, every capacity for it. And so to me, I feel like so much of what I inherited from my family was a story and a sense of responsibility um, to do the work, not just for myself, but like to always put my shoulder to the wheel for the bigger picture cause. And so I think that, I mean, so maybe that is a reconciliation that I've always, I've never thought that I could just like do me without, um, it's not just shoes to fill when your family's been working toward a cause for good, right? It's, uh, it's an obligation that is wrong to turn away from in my, to my mind. Um, and so I think that I'm working toward right now figuring out how to like live my fully realized art and still do that work. And that's sort of where that article came from. I mean, you know, I was thinking about, 
and forgive me if this is going over a future question, but I mean, but well, I'm sure we'll have lots to talk about, but you know, it was already a hard summer, right? It was already, it's been a hard 2020, full stop. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when George Floyd died and we watched that happen, and then the, um, the, the protests began you know, that first weekend in June, I felt um, so silenced by my own grief and my own, uh, like silenced and frozen by my own grief, my own sense of powerlessness, especially because, you know, I had, I didn't, I still am you know, quite fearful of COVID for a few health reasons of my own, but like, so I didn't feel like I could go protest. I couldn't figure out how I could do something that felt right and felt helpful and felt to scale um, of the grief I was feeling and the amount that I wanted to help. Um, and then finally, like two weeks, after two weeks of just like, just circling that, um, I just woke up one morning and wrote that article. I was like, I have to do something. I have to do something. And that's how that article happened was that I just reached a boiling point of going, what can I do? Because this is so, um, this is so grievous. I will regret it forever if I don't find a way to do something right to help. Like I can't just be like completely cowed into silence by this pandemic and by, you know, all of the like unspeakably long list of failures of the federal government in this moment. Right, right. So you write that the black people I come from were owned by white people I come from. And what do you know about your white ancestors? And you already talked about your black ancestry, but if you wanted to add on to that, that'd be great. What do I know about my white ancestors? So I know, I mean, you know, there's obviously the Edmund Pettus part. Um, and that is, I mean, if you look at pictures of my great grandfather side by side with Edmund Pettus, you're like, that is that man's child. It's crazy. Um, Cause you know, obviously one of the ways that they made sure that the erasure happened, luckily again, light skin, it's proof it's right here, but you know, they didn't, it's not like there were records of this stuff or records of whose child, all of a sudden a child's born and only has one parent. That's not how that works, biology, right? So, but all of that to say, um, we always knew that Ben Pettis story. I grew up, you know, I knew my grandfather, um, George, who knew his father, Will, and Will was the Edmund Pettis' son and he, and Will knew who his father was. Um, and then, you know, my, on my dad's side, on my, and then my, my mom's grandmother, so uh, Will is Edmund Pettus's son, my great-grandfather. Um, Will's wife, Deer, her father was also a white man from Alabama. Um, and, you know, her family just put her through, uh, you know, her family figured out how to you know, protect her from some of that. And so her, her black father took her in and, you know, cause I think there was some tension with the, uh, her father's white family saying, you know, we can't have this out in the world. And I think that's something I want to put up. I guess I can just speak tangentially to it for a second here. Cause I think that, you know, the more that I get asked these questions about that article and I'm still continue to be struck by people uh, who didn't feel like they could name the fact that they had that sort of dynamic in their family's past. And I'm like, why? And then, because to me, I'm like, there's no shame. I don't believe in victim shaming ever, full stop, right? And so I never was able to really understand why we would ever be ashamed of something that terrible that white people did to us that created this color any more than I would be ashamed of having a, of a family member who survived the middle passage, right? Like there's not, I don't, um, but then I think about Deer and I think about like, you know, the, the circumstances of her upbringing and I think, oh, right. Like it was dangerous to say anything. It was, you were in danger. And, 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 and what's crazy, that makes me wanna cry, but, and what's crazy is again in my life, you know, like my, grand, my great grandfather, Will, Edmund Pettus is like, he had a car, they were the only black family who had a brick house, even though they were living in the same neighborhood as everyone else. 
And it was because his father's family felt some sort of something about wanting to make, and which is complicated, right? It's, it's really complicated. Yeah. Um, but then by the same turn, you know, that he's the same man who would never let his wife, Deer, raise a finger in their house. He couldn't stand to see her clean anything in the house. He couldn't stand to see her cook because he was like, that's how I got born. That's how we get conceived as we work. These women who have to work in these white people's houses, that's how these rapes happen. That's how we get these yellow babies. Um, and so he never, till he died, he never let his wife cook or clean in front of him in his house. Like he did it or he, you know, got his children to do it. Um, but then, you know, on my, and then on uh, my dad's side, you know, on some parts of it are murkier. Like I know my Avon Williams's mother was a light skinned woman whose father was a white man from Knoxville. Um, I won't name him here, but uh, that's the thing that I do know. But my family's been a little bit close to the chest about it. And I, that's, that's a story that we haven't talked about in public and I'm not going to now. Although I am, I've uh, matched with a bunch of this man's relatives on ancestry.com. So <laughs> anyway, um, and then the one, my great grandmother, Alberta Bonta, this is on my father's side. She uh, was born on the same property where her family had been slaves to the family that her family then worked for when she was born in 1906. And her father, you know, her mother was this young woman named Phoebe and Phoebe was working in the house and the son of the house raped her. Um, and my great grandmother was conceived from that. And Phoebe lost her mind from that happening to her. And so my great grandmother, Alberta, was raised by her grandmother, uh, Lucy. And now this is the wildest part. So Lucy was born a slave on that same land to that same family. And Lucy raised her granddaughter, born in 1906. Her, grandma, her granddaughter who lived till I was 16 years old, who I saw like almost every weekend, so what's crazy to me to think about is I was raised by my half white great grandmother who was raised by her grandmother who was a slave to her father's family. Is that not crazy? It's crazy. Like, and, and what's crazy, and the craziest thing to me about it is how real that is because people think, oh, well, why are you so mad? Slavery was like so long ago. I'm like, well, my great grandmother taught me to cook and she was like in her rose garden until she died, 2005. She went out and cut roses and made tea just like she did every day at 98 years old, right here in Nashville in the 21st century, raised by her grandmother who had been born a slave, taught me so much of what I know about being a woman, about loving being black, about loving food, about everything. I'm like, it's not that far away to me. Like there was slavery in the living memory of that house. You know, so, and, but there was also this strange whiteness, you know, and that, that family's from way across Georgia. And I really haven't talked about that yet. So I'm not going to name any names of those people, but the cool thing about Alberta Bonton, now you're just getting a whole genealogy lesson, but I'm just going to tell you that what's really wild. And it makes you think about if there's hope anywhere, it's in moments like this, where you think, so Alberta was getting older and she was in Waycross and her white grandmother couldn't stand to see her granddaughter picking cotton or doing whatever, you know. And so she, um, she like, I, I want to say conspired, that's not the right word, but maybe it is. Maybe it was conspired. She and Lucy, the black grandmother, got together and said, we got to get this child out of here. And the white grandmother paid for her to go to this private Negro boarding school in Harlem. Wow. Yeah, and that's where my great-grandmother met my great-grandfather, who was a Harlem Renaissance poet, actually. But it's so crazy. So I don't know. I don't feel grateful to that woman, but I'm also like glad she did it. I don't feel like I owe her any gratitude, but I am still glad that it happened. And it gives me some hope that she got a right kind of feeling at some point. I guess. Wow. So you talk a little bit about how your personal history has affected you um, and your family. And could you talk a little bit about how that history has also affected you growing uh, up in Nashville? 
Um, yeah, so, I mean, I think that there's a little bit of it I touched on about, you know, knowing my grandfather's work that he did in this town um, for civil rights, you know, he was, uh, Z. Alexander Luby was, you know, the, the established civil rights lawyer here in Nashville. And after my grandfather worked for his cousin Thurgood for a minute, he then went, he moved to Nashville and came to work for uh, Mr. Luby. Uh, and so because of that, he was one of like the lawyers on the team that went and you know, bailed out John Lewis and Diane Nash and all those guys when they got arrested at the sit-ins in Nashville and all of that stuff. Um, and so again, like, you know, my grandfather's legacy in this space and knowing that I wanted to be, um, that I wanted to keep it up, that I wanted to like make that, make that continue to mean something. Um, that's been a big part of shaping my desire to move home. You know, after I, you know, I went away to boarding school for high school, I was in Boston for college. I, you know, dabbled with the idea of going to grad school in England after that. And like, but then I wound up in Mississippi and then I was like, I've just got to go home and do some good with this groundwork that's already been laid. And, you know, my great grandfather, the one who was uh, a poet, a Harlem Renaissance poet, he wound up um, being the, you know, writer in residence and a librarian at Fisk here in Nashville, mm -hmm. um, where my, my grandma grew up on the Fisk campus. So, you know, I like knew that I needed to have a life in words and a life that had like a Nashville foundations that, you know, worked with words and social justice. And then to say nothing of the fact that my mother is like this amazing writer country music and you know my mother's a novelist and a country music songwriter and that's how she wound up in Nashville and met my dad and you know the crazy crazy little black girl moving from Detroit to DC to Harvard to Nashville to write country music her her father thought she was crazy but um you know she found her niche in that space and you know it just made me feel like this was a place where I could um explore all of the different dimensions of black joy and black creativity and also where um, there was already so much groundwork laid that I was I was like inheriting like a big root system that I could like do some good work with you know rather than starting somewhere else so that's sort of where um, my investment in staying here came from and it's also and it's because I loved coming from here well, thank you. So in your piece, you mentioned cartoonish private statues. Can you expand on what you were referring to? I love that laugh. That, I'm like, I just wish I'm like, can I share my screen? Can I show this to people? Oh my God. Um, there is a statue of Nathan Bedford Forrest on I-65 um, here in Nashville. Uh, and it is appalling. I mean, it is, and by appalling, I mean, it's, there's something just, you know, it's grotesque and, and emotionally, morally violent about it being there. It's this guy owns that plot of land by the highway. It's private land, technically. Although the state of Tennessee paid to get the land cleared for him. So that, so my taxpayer, or I wasn't paying taxes when it was erected, but my parent, my family's taxpayer dollars paid to clear the like, I don't know, like, you know, the half moon of space that is required. And then he lined that little arc in the trees with Confederate flags and Tennessee flags. And then I am saying it's like this. I mean, I don't know. I've never seen it up close, but it is a, I mean, it's got to be 40 feet tall, this statue. Um, and it's Nathan Bedford Forrest rearing back on a horse. The horse's legs are up in the air. And then he's got his, you know, sword and he's making this ridiculous face like you know doing his confederate battle cry with his coat flapping behind him and the horse's tail but what's wild is the face looks like some four-year-old carved it out of a potato like it doesn't look like it, that's what i'm saying it's cartoonish like it's not a real face like the whole statue it, it it seems like it wants to be dignified but then he's like like he looks like his face is like melting off of a potato um, and he's kind of screaming and it's just, it looks silly. I remember saying to my dad, like, isn't it awful 
that that statue is there when I first saw it and, uh, you know, saying we need to take it down. Doesn't it upset you, Daddy? And he was like, if they, you know, want to show their ignorance in plain view, like, <laughs> it doesn't bother me. Like, look at that thing. It's embarrassment. Um, and I think that that's one perspective. I still think it's terrible that it's there. Um, but I, it did give me some relief, like my father's saying that, you know, that is an absurd looking like entity. You know, it's not a, it's not dignifying whatever it is that it's trying to dignify the way that it looks like that. So that was what I meant by the cartoonish private statue. I mean, it is, it's public and private, but we can't take it down because it's a private property that it's on. It's insane. Okay, so hold on a minute, Carolyn. I think I can figure out how to share it. Yeah, hold it. Let me let me see. Oh, did you find it? Yes, yes, yes. Let me see here. Oh my gosh, it is just a trip. It is a trip. That thing. Is that it? Can you? Yes. See it? <laughs> what did I say? I mean, do you see that? It's so ridiculous. It's the most ridiculous looking. Okay, so I was wrong. He was rearing back with a, a, a pistol, not a. <laughs> but doesn't it look like it was made by a child, like out of clay in elementary school art class? Like, look at that horse. I mean, it's just the most ridiculous thing in the world. Okay. Uh, people are texting those eyes. <laughs> Here, let me, I'm going to take it down. <laughs> So, so you get some feedback. Okay. Oh God. I mean, it really is a trip, right? I mean, you kind of go, how did anybody, I mean, and it must have cost a lot of money. I mean, it is big. I wish people could see it to scale. It's huge. Yeah. Anyway. I'll, make sure I'm, I'll make sure to look for it whenever when I'm rolling, rolling. Don't let it make you cause an accident. You know, I'm like, <laughs> whenever I know I'm driving by it, I'm like, don't look, don't look, don't look. It'll... <laughs> Let the ancestors protect me from this. Yeah. So my next question is, um, your piece powerfully illuminates how our past and our present circumstances are inextricably intertwined. Uh, other countries facing pa painful past that oppress the other establish the truth and reconciliation commissions to discover and reveal the past wrongdoing by a government or non-state actors in the hope of resolving conflicts left over from the past. You write about um, there are those people that want to maintain these Confederate monuments, quote, cannot understand the difference between rewriting and reframing the past. Mm -hmm. And you go on to say, I say it is not a matter of airbrushing history, but of adding a new perspective. How can we learn from the past to build a stronger, more equitable future? Um, well, the first step to learning, uh, and I'm a teacher, I've been an educator for you know, 10 years, which is crazy to me. I graduated from college in June of 2010. So this is my 10th year starting teaching school. Um, the first part of learning anything is like making sure you have like all of your documents, you know, like it's like you can't learn from a textbook that doesn't have all the pages, you know, you can't do a science experiment if you don't have all the materials. You cannot learn from history if you don't look at all of what happened. And I think the, I mean, I think to me, I mean, again, it sometimes it makes me want to cry, like just the more work that I've been doing, thinking and writing. Um, and even I, who am trying to make a life out of bearing witness and ringing alarms, like I, there's just still so much I don't know of what we've lost. Um, and that is, you know, the extraordinary efficacy of white supremacy. They are so good at covering their tracks, except for, <laughs> But they're, <laughs> I, know, I, know, I love it. I'm proof, I'm proof, I'm proof. But they are so good at covering their tracks. And you think about Black Wall Street, you think about the like 1898 massacre in uh, North Carolina, you think about, you know, the, I mean, any number of lynchings or threats of lynchings or silencings and like land hijackings. I mean, all of it. And then 
nothing was written down. It was all just done and then immediately forgotten about by the white people and then immediately been made to keep a secret even between like family members like you don't speak of it or you'll die you know and that is so all of that to say how do we learn from history by figuring out how to get all of the pieces of the puzzle of what happened um, and make sure there's a record of them and then figure out a way to make sure that they all get taught and then see where we are. Because I think that there's a certain amount of this white, of this belligerence from the other side that is to do with a, uh, an inability to imagine that their people could have done something like this. And so, but they're not necessarily people who, if faced with the truth would like, feel like they could in good conscience uh, condone or agree with it. So what they're doing right now is fighting their hardest to make sure that they never know it as truth. Um, and so I think that figuring out how to shine like a clear and relentless light, and then we'll see where we are with who really can't, doesn't care that it's true, right? And I think that that to me, and now what I will say is I'm a little bit frightened about that too. I'm frightened that we've, brewed some super bug, some MRSA virus of neoconservatism that doesn't care that it's true. Um, I think that, you know, I think that American exceptionalism is like the most dangerous ideological set that there is right now, because I think that it allows people to think that we're special, that we're the land of the free, and so we wouldn't let such, such something so terrible happen. And, I, and I'm so terrified by people who say that, like it can't be that bad because this is America and nothing like that happens in America. I'm kind of going, since when? <laughs> like which America did you live in where nothing like this happened? Like the America that marched the Indians like from like the East Coast to like the wilds of the Dakotas or the America that dragged people you know, in the bellies of boats, like from one continent to another, the America that put its Japanese citizens in internment camps, literally like in active living memory. I mean, which America do you meet that, that isn't capable of this? But somehow they still think like, oh, but America's land of the free and we're always walking toward progress. And what I will say is that in some broad strokes ways that has mostly been true, that the walking toward progress has happened until recently. And I will say that this regression that we're living through right now is really terrifying. Um, and I think that it's, um, you know, the regression has been good in some ways because it's um, for the people that just woke up, they're like, oh my God, what do we do? And they're trying to give platforms and space to like people of color who are, have been reading the alarm in quiet or in their like niche spaces in which they're, you know, we're being given bigger platforms and we're being given more time to tell hard truth. But I'm just hoping that the cure works faster than the disease kills us because I feel like we started this intervention late. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Uh, yeah. I said, I'm not sure. I'm not hopeful. I'm like, I'm not optimistic. I have cautious, fearful hope. I'd say. Yeah. So you recently published Other Ways to Save Blackface in the Atlantic. Would you mind reading that for us? I would not mind reading it for you. I'd be delighted to read it. Other Ways to Say Blackface. Take the court, he said. We were out walking. It made me feel free, he said. I stopped walking. I said, I'm sorry. I beg your pardon. Take the cork. Do you mean blackface? Yes, that's right, he said. It's natural to want to be different, to want to feel free. Oh, white boy. Oh, Lord. Oh, tell me, sir. Yes, tell me how you want to feel free. Old boy here on my street, tell me, 
Do I make you free? Am I your new black face? I mean, my black face next to yours. My black mouth on your mouth. Does that free you from your trim white body like that cork do? Am I just your little thick black sweet corkscrew? You know how it works, he said. After your parents have opened the bottle of wine, take one and burn the bottom. Take one, I said, one what? I said, oh, right, the cork. I said, oh, white boy, oh, Lord. Oh, the street fell away. I'd let you put your hand on my body in both of our wanting. And now you say blackface and you say free and you look at me and you say natural and you say free again and burn the bottom. And before I can conjure your young white hands with they match burned cork, smudging your face till it feels black and free. I am afraid of how much you don't know. And I am afraid of how much I can stand. Oh, white boy. Oh, Lord. Oh, take your cork, put it back in the bottle, stop up everything left of that strange nostalgia. Stop looking to feel free in my skin. Give it back to me without the burn, without the cork. My skin looks to you like the freedom your skin is. Thank you, and his people. <laughs> thank you, Caroline. Thank you. Thank you for letting me read that. I'm so sorry. your words vividly in the, illustrate differing perceptions and the ongoing efforts of people to construe and conflate history to satisfy their own needs. So I have two questions. <laughs> uh, <laughs> how did this work come about? And how should we deal with the ongoing issue of people trying to construe the past to sustain their self-interest at the expense of the other? Well, the first part of the question is, uh, fortunately, unfortunately, real simple. That just actually happened. I like, <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> plain face. <laughs> really? <laughs> I mean, you can't make that up, can you? I mean, I swear this man told me that he, he said that he used to take the cork. He said, I remember the first time I took the cork. I, swear, I just stopped walking in the street. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. And, you know, and you know, take the cork is a really old school term for blackface, you know? That was what was so wild to me. I was like, you're using straight up oppressive white minstrelsy language. Ugh. You know, like take the cork is straight from the minstrel, you know, the minstrel show. Because they used to burn cork and just smudge the bottom of a wine cork, you know, on their face. Or you buy a cork paste if you were, you know. And I just, and I, and which is wild. I knew that only because I'd taken AFAM with Skip Gates at Harvard, <laughs> which is like the most ridiculous, like circuitous, bougie, but also like Black Ac Academy, like saving saving grace moment of life for me. But I was like, do you, you know, I wouldn't have even known to advocate for myself. I might've just let it slide. You know, I could have take the cork, oh, whatever, keep walking. But I really, I stopped in the street. I said, are you trying to tell me that you used to wear blackface and that you miss it? And then he said to me that it, he, of course he did because it made him feel free to take on another face. And I was like, what kind of limitations of perspective must you have? I mean, at nine years old, 
you know, growing up in the late, he's a little older than I am. So like growing up in the late eighties, early nineties, like I could imagine you like you watch, I don't know, family matters or you watch fresh Prince, or you watch what, and you think Will Smith is the coolest thing, or you think whoever on TV is the coolest thing and you want to look like, but the fact that he could say that without any informed perspective, I mean, this happened in 2018. So it was time for, he should have known, right? Like we, Tana Hasty have been in the world, like Barack, like we have language for this now. Um, and the fact that he didn't have any um, added nuance from, from this vantage was like so extraordinary to me that he could just continue to say, it's natural to want to put on another face. I, and it made me feel free. And I think to myself, free to be a black man instead of a white man in this country it made you feel freer that means you must not know what that is and you know there's a wonderful book and i forgive me the author's name is escaping me right now but there is a book called everything but the burden and the sub and the subtext is what white people take from black america or something like this right and i think that there's you know I and mean, I think that the appropriation, the thought of, I mean, and it comes back to what I said in your first question, like, you know, about how being Black's impacted my life. I love being Black. You know, I remember, can I cuss on this? I, I won't, but there's a, there's a <laughs> wonderful Instagram <laughs> meme that's going there around. It's like, I love being Black. <laughs> it's just dangerous, but it's lit, right? Like, <laughs> okay. Like, and, and I'm like, that feels so real to me. And I, I don't know what it would feel like to come from the group that wasn't as cool. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what that would feel like. But you know, it's, there's a high tax and it's, uh, there's a high tax and we, you know, deserve all the joy we get for all of the, what it costs. Yeah. Um, and I think when people try and take on pieces of it that are our joy, just for their own pleasure, it cheapens them. That, you know, it doesn't tire me. Like appropriation just makes me weary. It doesn't hurt me. It doesn't, um, it doesn't cost me anything. It just makes me tired and it makes me um, afraid. I mean, it's, I'm afraid for, I'm afraid for the country because I'm afraid of how uh, limited the imaginations of people who try and take on pieces of our truth without acknowledging the past are you know it's like getting an organ transplant and not taking your medicine or like you know sewing something on that's not meant to be attached to you without figuring out how it works you know or, and honoring whatever sacrifice was made to get you that new resource like I don't know I think there's something I'm still reckon I'm still reckoning with that in a lot of directions. I don't know that I have a full thought about um, what we do with that function of culture yet, because I also think that you know we are there's really cool stuff that comes with black culture that, you know, if somebody wants to make smart blues music and they're white but they are engaging in an act of appreciation and celebration instead of appropriation, like I don't want to stop that, right? Like I want to. I don't want it to be that, because I think there is a hypocrisy at some point to saying, well, you can't have this because of your race. Like, I like, because I think that that's the, the whole point is, you know, that's what we're, that's what we're fighting against is that language. Right. Um, but by the same turn, there are some things you just can't have because of your race. Especially, there, and certainly there are some things white people cannot ha like have from us. I mean, ta Hasty said it best. He was talking about using the N-word. He was like, there are some words that some people can use that some people just can't. You know, he's like, you know, you can't call my wife baby girl. I can. You know, it's like there are words that are for some people and not for others. And sometimes they're intimate, personal words. And sometimes they are collective cultural words. Um, but I don't know, those rules are so subjective. And it does get really murky and I do ultimately want to err on the side of inclusion. And I get really skittish about committing myself to saying anything that um, sounds like there's a, any group that can't have access to a thing because of their color in either direction because I think it, it's a slippery slope. But 
oh why boy oh lord that's all I can say <laughs> Do you know? like that's, I wrote it the poem like <laughs> why boy oh lord like I don't know like why do you want to say it in the first place like we just need to educate them they just, right. need to, just have to go there so the next question is a little of a tangent but I could not resist I love it go <laughs> how do you feel about all the recent Rachel Dolezal discoveries I mean we had one who was a professor two were professors I I just had to go there with you girl <laughs> help um That's how I feel. I mean, I have not, I, I, it's, it's preposterous. Do you know, I mean, I think it's preposterous, uh, but it's also, I mean, it seems to be some kind of like, I mean, there's clearly some kind of mental illness at work that I don't feel qualified to speak on. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I think there is something really fraught about you know, these weren't people that were like lying on an application and then presenting some other way. Like these were people that were trying to take on a burden that was not their birthright um, for good or ill. Mm. And I don't know what to say about that. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, obviously there's the, ob the, 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 the like first step, which is just like, it's, it's an, ins it's insane and it's deeply inappropriate and um, damaging and troubling. Um, but then past that, you just kind of go, I mean, I really, I just feel like it's some, it's the same way I won't comment on like sort of virulent black Republicans. Like I do think it's a form of insanity and I'm not even joking. Like, I think that there's something wrong. Like when you watch somebody talk and you're like, either you're like a real mercenary snake who's like, I'm just gonna get in where I fit in. And so I've made my bed with the enemy and I'm gonna say whatever I need to get the things that I need. I won't name her name, but it rhymes with Schmandis Snowin. Um, but or you're or you've lost your mind through trauma i mean and i think that there's like an element of stockholm syndrome about it right like like it's like you it's like you know ben carson grew up in poor and black in mississippi that can make you crazy it can make you crazy like i don't know what happened to him but you know all i know i don't know any same black republicans i'll say that uh <laughs> God help me, I'm saying this on actual live streaming. Oh, actual live. It's fine. Yeah. Um, and by the, I, but I genuinely, I have some compassion because I think it's insanity. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know how to deal with that. I don't know. And if it's not insanity, then I have some other things to say. But I think, you know, and for these poor white women that are trying to be black people, I'm just, I just, I, all I can do is sigh. Yeah. All I can do is sigh and say like, you know, don't stop taking things from us. Stop taking, stop taking things. <laughs> Thank you. So um, in closing, cause we want to give um, people an opportunity to ask you some questions. So in closing, um, 2020 uh, has been a difficult and somewhat of a tragic, tragic year for all of us. So the losses of George Floyd, uh, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and so many others due to um, police brutality and the loss of John uh, Lewis. The systemic inequities, disparities, and flaws revealed by COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic on um, Black and other vulnerable peoples. Um, I just wanted to ask if you could reflect on the turbulent time we find ourselves in and touch upon your uh, perspective, the meanings and the lessons we can draw from these shared experiences. Golly. Well, you know, it's not funny, but you know, I'll start with Brianna because her mind, she's on all of our minds. Um, and, you know, I'm having, and I think we talked about this a little bit before we went live, but, you know, one of the lessons from that is 
just to, for me has been to just pause with grief, you know, and I've been really, um, I can, I stay stunned by her death. Um, and I think everyone does. And I am what's, but I'm so, I'm so stunned and so sad that I don't even know. I haven't even been able to put my heart in the cause of like calling for justice with her murderers because it won't bring her back. And I'm so tired and sad, but I think that under that you sort of go like that. I don't care about them. It makes me think, what are we doing about the police? You know, like that question feels so urgent to me because them being brought to justice or not to me is past the point at this point. The point is, how is it that it was legal at all, any of it? How is it that they weren't put in jail immediately because that was malpractice? How is it that they had those weapons and could discharge them in that space in the first place? Like it's so systemic and she was so faultless that you kind of, I mean, as, as everyone who's been murdered by the police is, I'm not trying to imply that anyone else was not, but I mean, but she was asleep. Like there was nothing at all to confuse. There was no, like, she was not, there was no engagement of any kind. Um, there's like zero negative mystery, in fact, you know, to uh, her, her part in the exchange. And you just go, we can't live in a country where a poli where it's okay where it's not okay for a young black man to walk around with a hoodie and a bag of Skittles. And it is okay for a police officer to like accidentally murder someone in their sleep. Like we just can't live in that country. Like I, we can't. Um, and so to me, it just makes me feel very urgent about demanding reform, but it also just makes me think we've got to figure out this election and I'm afraid for that. Um, uh, I mean, yeah, I think that that's sort of where I am with all of the death, frankly, is that we've got to honor John Lewis by figuring out how to use our vote better um, once more. We've got to, and I mean, and there's, and what's come, and what I will say I've been thinking about a lot to, you know, in relationship to that is like, you know, living in these times where we're all on the screens and the, you know, the last, in my lifetime, I was born in 1987, so end of Reagan, uh, beginning of HW. You know, in my lifetime, 12 of the years of presidents in my life have not been elected by the American people. <laughs> I mean, think about that. Like, not, like the like majority of Americans did not vote for the presidents for, for 12 of the years of my 33 years. Like almost half my life, we have not had a president that was the will of the people. Um, and to me, I'm, I think about John Lewis and he's like, you know, our, our greatest weapon against tyranny is the ballot box, is the vote. Um, and I think that we haven't figured out a way I mean, and a vote is a fight for your life. And I think that there is something um, clarifying about feeling, you know, to me, I've been saying recently in private and I'll say in public for the first time, it sort of, to me, feels right now like the Cold War and the Civil War had a baby <laughs> and named it 2020. Do you know, it's like we're living this cold civil war right now. And I'm like, but wartime is clarifying. Um, and like what you're willing to risk your life for. And it's, and, and, and it, it, it gives people a cause. And you know, John Lewis had to march across a bridge facing dogs and guns to vote. And like, I'm gonna have to leave my house and spend a time in closed quarters for the first time since March with other people to risk my life to vote because I'm afraid of COVID. And Donald Trump has created a world where I could really die from that disease and he hasn't dealt with it, but I'm gonna go vote in person because it's worth my life. It is worth my life to cast my vote for democracy this year. And I think like that is inspiring to me in this moment. And I think like it's scary and heartbreaking and also galvanizing to think that we're being asked to risk our lives for this election and we, but we are, and we just have to, like we just have to, we have to, so yeah. Yeah. 
So thank you so much. So uh, Marquita Bradshaw also for all the Tennesseans here. Marquita Bradshaw, vote for her. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> No, no, no. Okay, so we are. Uh, if you're open for a few questions, yeah, let's do it. Questions. We'll see because we ask people to send us questions, and Tony will send those questions to us. So we'll give them a few minutes because there's a bit of a lag. Let me see here. Yeah. So it's okay. Wait. All right. Not any yet. Okay. Oh, but let me just read you some of the things that people were saying when you were talking about the statue, horrible statue. Carved potato, those <laughs> eyes. <laughs> okay. Um, one of our other persons said it's now covered in pink paint. Did you know that? No. Oh my gosh. I had no idea. I'm also <laughs> fine with if we don't have questions, I'm also I'm also happy to just chat to you or you know, whenever we we talk for an hour to these lovely people, but I'm happy to, but no, no hard feelings if there are no questions. I'm happy okay, to cool. Okay. Um, so tell me a, a little bit, and, and if they're calm, they come. So, um, um, so do you know anything about social work? What do you know about social work as a profession? Oh my gosh, that is a question that I I know that it's what we should be funding instead of the police. Oh, that's a good response. <laughs> that's an excellent response. You know a lot right there. You're absolutely right. <laughs> I mean, you know, I have a friend, I've had a couple of friends who've gone into social work. I mean, I feel like it's such um, a sort of like, I mean, my, my understanding of it is limited, but it also feels like it's a calling that is like really dimensional and like circumstance specific, you know, like it can be, you know, intervening, um, you know, in a school with, you know, students who are at risk, or it can be like, you know, engaging with people in their homes it can be like, you know, working in an office and like having people come to you to figure out like how they're doing or what they're needing. Like, I mean, I think that it's a, it's the um, practical application of a lot of like important therapy work, like therapist work, you know, is how, is, is my understanding of it, which is, as I've acknowledged, already limited. Oh, that's okay. That was a, that was just a question I threw in there. And so uh, let me see here. Tony just put a, a question in. And it says, um, from our dean, we think self-care is important. How do you engage in self-care in these difficult days? Well, one, I've been guard learning to garden some. <laughs> um, and I've been trying to gather my friends outdoors, social distance, obviously. Um, and figuring out when to look away occasionally because you have to have energy for the long fight so the moments of saying i'm choosing not to read this or i'm not doing the news right now um just to make sure that you stay sane that you maintain your sanity um and that you don't let your heart get all the way broken you know, it's like you have to flex the muscles and you have to exercise and like, but you don't want to break, you don't want to break yourself trying to get strong for this. So I think that that's my, those are my big self-care things, gardening and friends and knowing when to look away because I mean to fight another day, not because I'm giving up on the fight. Well, wow, that's a very good answer. Appreciate it. So I'm reminded of a conversation I had a couple of, well, just the other day after um, the news broke about um, what type of charges will be brought against the officers who um, were a part of Breonna Taylor's death. And this individual said to me, you know, when I hear news like this, I feel almost, I can kind of understand what it must have been like to be a slave. And, um, holding out that one day you would be free, but maybe the reality is that you would never see freedom. And he asks, I wonder what we need to do in this time, you know, where we might not see um, equal justice based on our skin. Um, I wonder what, what would you offer that person in terms of encouragement or just your own perspective about that? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm working through that question myself. <laughs> um, here are some things that I have come up with. 
<laughs> so far. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I will go from the deeply practical to the wildly eccentric. Um, but one of the things I would say to that person is almost all of the times, except maybe the last, we live in a weird, I do think that I grew up in like a weird, like almost reconstruction era America, like post civil rights movement. It was like we had this moment where like there was sort of like some version of colorblind casting on television, which colorblindness is not good, but it's it was not. like there was this like fake sense of the American melting pot rainbow that was propagated and like children's television and all of these things like, you know, the mighty ducks with like Keenan and like, you know, like all that with like all, I mean, there was, there was this like sort of forced ch children's television diversity. You know, we had family matters. We had, Fresh Prince, like we had these, like, we had this moment of feeling like on a super surface level, America's goal and aesthetic was intersectional. Um, and that was a lie, right? But all of that to say, but it was just like reconstruction after the civil war, you know, like there were all those black congressmen and like black property owners. And then Jim Crow came and clarified things, right? For the, for the ill, but, um, I would say that apart from that last like little window, we are here and everybody that came before us was in a worse position. And so we can't get too afraid because we come from people who have already survived worse. And that to me is a really important thing to remember. And now there are some white people on our side that are willing to put themselves in danger and that might make a difference. Um, and I think, and I don't know if it will, but it might. So that's one thing I will say on the practical level. Um, other things I have said, you know, it's okay to just, if, and I think that if we are really in danger, which is not clear to me completely, um, I mean, I mean, everyone, we're all in danger every day, but when I mean danger, if we're really in danger of abandoning the project of American democracy for fascism, say, um, <laughs> and tyranny, um, I don't know, it's not completely clear to me that that's what's happened fully. I mean, there's like been a whiff of that, we're leaning, but I just don't know if we're like pre or post. For those of you who don't know, this is an embarrass. this is a really nerdy World War I reference. So if you don't know World War I stuff, sorry. But I don't know if we're pre or post the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, like the assassination of the Archduke. Like I'm like, because after that happened, World War I was inevitable. Before it happened, there was some diplomacy that could have happened to stop. So I don't know, I don't know um, where we are in that near, that arc. And what I will say is if we're there, it's okay to just leave. Like, you know, it's like, it's okay. Like there was, you know, like slavery wasn't over, but like Harriet Tubman got, like people escaped, like people ran away, like people mailed themselves, like, went on the underground tunnel, if the underground railroad, like, I'm like, maybe we need to start digging tunnels to Canada. Like, I don't know. I mean, and I, I'm kind of joking. I'm kind of not like, get your passport. You know, like James Baldwin had to peace out. Like, you know, Josephine Baker left, Bricktop left, Richard Wright left. I mean, if you need to go, go. Oh. Do you know, I mean, I think if we can't do it here, you can just leave if you can figure out how to go. Um, and I don't know. I don't know if that's comforting or not, but except for to say that you know, people, and I mean, sh I have this funny feeling that it's not actually out of the question for like some of the most reasonable civilized countries of this world to offer us refugee status. I'm like, Justin Trudeau, you gonna let me in? Angela, like <laughs> Macron, y'all gonna have, y'all, I'm not gonna turn to England because Boris Johnson seems to be another weird haired buffoon. But, um, Anyway, you can just go or we'll like underground railroad to Canada, but also we've lived through this. We've, we've, we come from people who survived the middle passage. We can do this. So we had two questions and one of them is why would someone with a different political perspective have to have a mental illness? Uh, I said, well, I didn't say someone, I said black people with the with Republican tendencies. 
because the Republican Party does not have policies that support the condition of being Black in America. And I think it's a sign of um, mental instability to vote against your own best interests. That's my answer. All right, thank that you. That question. So the other question is, how do you explain uh, current situation to your kids if you have a boy? I don't know what to say to that question. I uh, I don't know what to say. I think it's like it's something I wonder about. I'm not lucky enough to have children yet. Um, what I say to the parents is like, I am. I'm gonna fight for your children. I'm gonna fight for your sons to not have to be afraid for their lives being up, up, being alive in public. Um, you know, I would say, you know, teach them. I mean, what I would say to my kids if I had if I had a son right now, what I would be doing is talking to him all the time about uh, his value and his worth. And the different in you, and the fact that other people not being able to understand it doesn't mean that it's not valuable, and that it makes him, you know, it makes him doubly, triply, quadruply responsible for protecting the precious thing that he is, because other people don't understand it, and that there's no, there's a great dignity in being careful with yourself. Um, and I, you know, it's sad for me to just teach, say, teach your children to just be so terribly cautious. But I think that I would say, teach them to be cautious and teach them that there is power in that. Um, teach them that that is an act of rebellion against oppression to figure out how to be safe um, until this craziness abates. Um, And I would also, I mean, I don't know, there's stuff that I would say that I don't even want to say or believe, but as I'm like, I wonder, yeah, there's, I mean, there's parts of it where I'm like, make sure they're like socioculturally bilingual so that they know how to talk to people in a way that those people that will hurt them understand. Um, but I hate that. I hate, I hate, I hate wanting to say that because I think that you should talk how you want to talk and be who you want to be, but I would, but yeah, so that's sort of my, that's sort of where my, my thoughts lie with that, but it's just such a, um, it's such a, it's such a heartbreaking, grievous condition we're in right now with that. Yeah. Another question is going to school from Nashville to Knoxville was a culture shock and social work is primarily a quote, white career, what advice do you have for people of color who are navigating through this profession? Well, you know, and again, I'm, I'm visiting the School of Social Work, at, and but not having been a social worker myself, um, I can only give you uh, more global advice about what it's, what the work is, or what I would say to anyone who's entering a primarily white space as a professional is, um, you know, find, uh, what is it? This is a, I just was in another panel and one of the panelists quoted Tyler Perry, who is not somebody that I quote under all circumstances. But one of the reasons that he's nearly a billionaire is because he's figured out this thing, which he said is to super serve your niche. You know, it's like the people like find your lane and serve the people who need you. Um, and, you know, disproportionately, you know, people of color interact with social workers, right? But so if there are too many, you are going to be a representative that is going to mean something different and find a way to like, to be lifted up by who you're serving instead of who your colleagues are, if that helps you. Um, and then also I would say, 
you know, the spirit of the work is right-minded, right? So I would say, keep your eyes peeled for the right-minded people in your space who you can figure out how to trust and figure out how to turn into like active allies mm -hmm. because building a team, a cohort of active allies is so critical right now. Wow, thank you. The next question is, um, when race or culture is brought up in the classroom, it is usually followed by silence by my white classmates. How can we have these conversations when people are choosing not to speak or how can we encourage engagement? So you, you have a teaching background. Yeah, I don't know if they get this deep, but yeah. Um. I mean, it depends. Uh, so if, if you're the student, wait, was this from a, sorry, did I see this question? Um, can I see this question? Okay. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't really make sense. Uh, okay. So, okay. So I, so it's hard. Cause I mean, as a teacher, I just don't let that slide. Uh, <laughs> like if you don't want to talk, then I'm just going to like force everyone to go around and answer the question. <laughs> Do you know, like, I'm a, I'm a little bit of a stickler for participation in that way. Um, and then with the, you know, as a student, as a student, there's not much you can do except for, you know, going to the professor afterward and saying, like, I really need you to be an advocate. And if you're going to put this stuff in the room, I need you to be, um, I need you to govern the room in a way that generates real conversation because otherwise this is um voyeuristic and like traumatizing to me uh, <laughs> i mean so i'd say advocate for yourself to your professor or your educator in your room if it's if you can't if you're the student um and if you have any authority or charge in the classroom i would say you know, figure out questions that people can't help but answer. Um, you know, like if you say, instead of saying, do you want to talk or not? You don't give them that choice. It's like with anything. It's like, you don't tell a kid, do you want to eat your vegetables or not? You say, do you want to eat green beans or broccoli? You know, and then like one or the other is going to have to happen, right? So I say, you know, with a student, it's like, don't, who among, who wants to answer this question? No. Raise your hand if you feel like this is true. Raise your hand if you feel like, I'm giving you two options, this thing or this thing. Raise your hand if you think thing one is true. Raise your hand if you think thing two is true. If you didn't raise your hand, explain why, right? Like, you know, there's a, there are ways to set it up so that everyone has to weigh in. Um, and so figuring out ways, or, you know, it's like find specific readings where everyone has to offer up some kind of interpretation of the facts that are presented um things like that you know uh unflinching sort of unimpeachable uh choice making practices and like data or information navigation those are the ways that i like sort of insist on people weighing in when they are um leery about it or, or reticent rather yeah good stuff i mean you talked about the the student and their role as a participant engage in this type of work and also to the instructor because it is their responsibility kind of helps um, model um, the behavior and also navigate those spaces in the classroom. So um, another question is because I'm really just um, excited about the way you use um, the written words and also the spoken words to kind of speak truth to um, you know, injustices. And uh, I'm wondering if you have some ideas about how we might integrate, you know, poetry or any other form of art into raising awareness about, um, you know, racial injustice or any other social ill. Oh my gosh. Well, I mean, I think that I mean, so many of my favorite poets, that's like the whole bread and butter of much of their work. Um, and so I think that, uh, you know, sending poems to people who need a lift, like posting poems and then reflecting on them, you know, get on Instagram live and read your favorite poem about social justice and then talk about it, you know, post a poem with your own art on Facebook. 
um, write your own work in response to things. Like, don't be afraid to share your stuff. Like there's no, like in this moment and these kind of moments and these kind of movements, like that's when like folk art becomes so yeah. crucial, right? So it's like, never be shy about what you've got to say and just post it, reflect on it, put it out in the world. Like, I love it when somebody just shares like a screenshot of a poem they were reading on any of my socials. You know, I love it when somebody decides they're gonna like start a YouTube channel and read poems on it or whatever it is. Like you've seen that in every, I think that just being brave about sharing the things that touch you and just um, keeping your eyes peeled to the artists in the moment and the movement. You know, there's like black poetry, Twitter is like a huge thing, believe it or not. There are so many artists. But I mean, you can even just start with Maya Angelou, you know, like, I mean, there's, there's so many ways in, but uh, I would say just start, because again, that's part of self care too. It's finding the art that sustains you through the crisis is so critical, right? And so I think, and then once you found it, sharing it with other people is just the right thing to do. Yeah, so thank you. So I don't see any more questions coming up. And um, so what I want to say is like Caroline, um, the power of your words, uh, they not only reflect the truths, but they use um, elegant hist hist honesty to enable us to better understand our world and to give us hope for the future. And for that, we offer our deepest thanks and appreciation. Thank you so much. And uh, I wanna also say thank you to uh, Dr. Harold Bennis and also to our outreach and engagement team for helping us host this event. And um, I'm grateful for this opportunity. And thank you all for participating. Ashe. Thank you so much for having me. I hope I didn't say anything that upset anybody. <laughs> well, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> I'm trying to speak truth as I see it. All right, I look forward to meeting you in person one day. Yes, we are gonna do it, COVID. We're gonna live past this. Okay. Take care, Caroline. Thank you, Camille. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye.